If you know who Barbara Tuckman is, you might be surprised to find her featured in this series. After all, other people I've covered so far have altered how professional historians speak about and think about past and the practice of history, but not Tuckman. Tuckman did not write for other historians, but rather popular history for a general public. Just to be clear, I don't like referring to someone as a popular historian. It's somewhat clumsy as a terminology. A piece of work can be popular history. Usually that means a book length narrative written without assumptions that the reader has any prior knowledge. But authors can write more than one type work. And though Tuckman did write almost exclusively popular history, I prefer to talk about the work, not the author in this regard. Because in addition to the more famous books, Tuckman produced a volume on their method and philosophy called Practicing History in 1981. And that will be the main focus for today. Tuckman's early career was in journalism and government work before writing Bible and Sword in 1956. That was not particularly successful, but a subsequent work on the outbreak of the First World War, The Guns of August, published in 1962, was an instant bestseller. It was not universally well received by researchers, but non-specialists loved it. There is an anecdote that it was read by Kennedy before the Cuban Missile Crisis and informed his attitude to his military advisers. You know, last summer I read a book, The, uh, the Guns of August. Mm -hmm. I wish every man on that blockade line had read that book. It's World War I, it's 13 million killed. It was all because the militaries of both alliances believed they were so highly attuned to one another's movements and dispositions, they could predict one another's intentions. But all the theories were based on the last war. Tuckman would publish five more books before her death, none quite as successful as The Guns of August, but all widely read. However, today I want to focus on practicing history and what it tells us about how a historian who writes primarily popular history thinks about method. I will pick out three strands. Tuckman's attitude to primary sources, the centrality of writing, and the rejection of what she calls systems. While preparing this episode, I spoke to several people and a common sentiment expressed was that popular history rests almost entirely on secondary literature. It does not use primary sources. But Tuckman takes exactly the opposite position, writing, my feeling about secondary sources is that they are helpful but pernicious. I use them as guides at the start of a project to find out the general scheme of what happened, but I do not take notes because I do not want to end up simply rewriting someone else's book. I plunge as soon as I can into the primary sources, the memoirs and the letters, the general's own account of their campaign. In fact, Tuckman often argues academic historians are uninterested in primary sources and that secondary literature dominates academic discussion, which seems odd, but is, I think, explicable. In historical study, the relationship between primary and secondary sources is complicated. The only legitimate evidence comes in the form of primary sources. All historical claims need to be rooted in them. But that doesn't mean you look only at the primary source. There are lots of primary sources I am not qualified to interpret, whether that's because it's a niche specialism like archaeobotany or simply a subject I know very little about. Even when I am, the secondary literature helps me to see the range of possible interpretations that can be placed on a single piece of evidence. Historians rarely get to a sound answer on their first attempt. So yeah, I think it's true that I read more secondary than primary literature. Tuckman is also here echoing a Rankian view of primary sources. If the historian will submit himself to his material instead of trying to impose himself on his material, then the material will ultimately speak to him and supply the answers. I suspect it is this Rankian position that sources are an essentially transparent thing which informs the rejection of secondary literature. If you perceive no intergenerational progress or refinement in our readings, but see insight as a function of individual genius, then researchers do, indeed, spend far too much time reading each other's work. 
I began here because it illustrates how Tuckman's perspective is useful. It would never have even occurred to me to think about why a researcher often seems to read more secondary than primary literature, because I would never, from my perspective, have perceived that they do. The second thread that comes up in practising history is writing, and writing as an art. Tuckman asks, should the historian be an artist? Certainly a conscious art should be part of his equipment. I think of myself as a storyteller, a narrator who deals in true stories. This is central to Tuckman's understanding of popular history. Popular history should engage the reader, intrigue and entertain them. In fact, this observation is often extended to history in general, and a failure to live up to that standard often becomes a criticism. When I say that I felt like an artist, I mean that I constantly found myself perceiving a historical truth, Tuckman writes. By seizing upon a suggestion, then after careful gathering of the evidence, conveying it in turn to the reader, not by piling up a lot of all the facts I have collected, which is the way of the PhD. It shapes the way Tuckman writes. There is a focus on anecdotes, I'll come back to that for the reading, and on biography, finding particular people around which to build a story. As a prism of history, biography attracts and holds the reader's interest in the larger subject. People are interested in other people, in the fortunes of the individual. And of course, everything Tuckman writes is narrative, whereas a researcher like myself tends to write about specific problems. Tuckman has no interest in doing that, both because it doesn't make a good story, or even really a story at all, and because, as just covered, that would mean engaging with the secondary literature in order to work out what the problems were. I think here is where this is most interesting, where she reflects on how to write history in a way that is readable. But there are dangers. Obviously, there's no virtue in work so dull no one reads it, but there is also little merit in work, however well written, which communicates nothing of value. There is a role for works which communicate well-known ideas to large audiences unfamiliar with them, but also a role for work which adds to the sum total of human knowledge. And even if the latter has only a small audience, it is still a cumulative benefit. Not that there is any good reason for either type of history to be written badly, but the relationship of writing, breadth of audience, and what is being communicated are more complex than is often assumed, either in research or popular history. What is history for? It is a little hard to pin Tuckman down on this point. Though the books depend on contemporary resonances to engage the reader, she repeatedly takes shots at systematizers a vague term, but certainly including the then famous, but now largely forgotten, Toynbee. Prefabricated systems make me suspicious, and science applied to history makes me wince, Tuckman writes in the introduction. In the latest section, they address more directly the question of whether you can learn lessons from history and write, when people want history to be utilitarian and teach us lessons, that means they also want to be sure that it meets scientific standards. This in my opinion, it cannot. To practice history as a science is sociology, an altogether different discipline, which I personally find antipathetic, although I suppose the sociologists would consider that my deficiency rather than theirs. In the 60s and 70s, a lot of historical work did seek to find general systems to make predictions or to define itself as scientific. That has since fallen out of favour. Most historians today subscribe to some form of what I call historical contingency. The idea that historical events have to be understood within the peculiar circumstances of their time, rather than by reference to general patterns. But Tuckman was embedded in a discipline that was still vigorously arguing this point out, and there are pains to make clear that there is no useful predictive function in historical study. Picking on a famous example, they write, Marxism, as the revealed truth of history, was probably the most convincing dogma ever enunciated. Its influence was tremendous, incalculable, continuing. The founder's facts were correct, his thinking logical and profound. He was right in everything but his conclusions. So what use is history if it can provide neither general law nor predict future events? As I said, it is hard to pin Tuckman down, but I think it is a belief that studying history, 
particularly human foibles, the package of variables impossible to duplicate, prepares us better to understand our own times. And I think in the end we come back to Tuckman's self-identity as a writer. The implication or meaning for our time arise in the mind of the reader, but such lessons, if present and valid, must emerge from the material, not the writer. I did not write to instruct, but to tell a story. In short, Tuckman does see the role of history as primarily to engage or entertain, to tell a story, but does, does not see that as a failing. A reader can find meaning for themselves. Tuckman's perspective is what makes practising history interesting. Unlike White, Said, Bloch and Kuhn, who I have discussed so far in this series, Tuckman was not a professional academic, nor in any sense a theorist or a philosopher. Unlike those writers, her income came from sales of books, not a salary. Oh, and obviously she wasn't a man. Yes, that is a question that has come up. Has Tuckman's perspective been ignored because of her gender? C wrote an article in 1990 suggesting precisely this. She didn't have a PhD. She had used that time slot in her early life to marry and have three children. By this activity, she had rendered herself invisible to the history establishment. I've actually found no evidence there is even a grain of truth in this assessment. It is something that would be completely unsurprising if it were true. But it isn't, and C does not seem to have checked. It also paints Tuckman as a radical outsider, and that isn't true either. Tuckman may not have been regularly discussed in philosophy of history, but practising history was listed in the annual bibliography for history and theory. Her books were widely, if often critically, reviewed in relevant journals, and with the advantage of modern databases, I can see there are hundreds of citations to her by academics. If Tuckman's impact was limited, it was by the choice of popular history as an output, and the focus Tuckman evinces on primary sources of course renders the work uninteresting to a researcher who will already be familiar with the same source material. To add to the sum total of knowledge in a field, a work needs to engage with the existing secondary literature, and Tuckman advises the writer of popular history against precisely that. I find it hard to believe a woman working primarily in the 60s and 70s did not experience some misogyny in the reception of her work, but everything I have seen suggests it is her choice of form, not her gender, which primarily limited the reception, and nowhere near as much as C assumes. Amongst the papers in Practising History, Is History a Guide to the Future has been reprinted in a collection of historiographic essays called The Vital Pasts. I would not actually recommend it as a reading. I think Tuckman is most interesting when discussing the written word. If I were to recommend a single piece, it would be History by the Ounce, which was originally published in Harper's Magazine in 1965, and which discusses the use of what Tuckman calls corroborative detail. Corroborative detail will often reveal a historical truth, she writes. When I was investigating General Mercia, the Minister of War who was responsible for the original condemnation of Dreyfus, the Dreyfus affair is a famous anti-Semitic incident in which a French artillery officer was falsely accused of espionage in 1894. I discovered that at parties of the Haute Monde, ladies rose to their feet when General Mercier entered the room. That is the kind of detail which to me is worth a week of research. It illustrates the society, people, the state of feeling at the time more vividly than anything I could write and in shorter space. It epitomises it crystallises, it visualises, it is memorable. Critical reader could of course see this as the fallacy of anecdotal reasoning. What one reviewer referred to as half-truths, innuendos and absurd generalisations. But that is what makes this section so interesting. It is not just a skilled writer pointing out how effective such an anecdote is rhetorically, but defending it as a legitimate historical tool. And at some points, criticising professional historians for a failure to engage with such details. In conclusion, an author does not need to present a coherent philosophical system to be of historiographic interest. We are willing to take the time to read sympathetically the reflections of a master craftsman, and there is no question 
Tuckman was a master of the craft. They can be as informative as any theorist's analysis. I don't think it is even necessary to agree with Tuckman to find the perspective useful. And I would suggest it as a reading in any course on historical practice. Mm -hmm.